The murky waters of Lake Superior enveloped me as I descended into the depths near the Duluth Ship Canal. Despite the notorious currents, I felt confident with my guidelines secured to a rebar spike driven into the sand. As I swam deeper, the crystal clear water gave way to an eerie brown wall of silt stretching for miles. Crossing into it plunged me into total darkness. My heart raced as I ventured further, the only sound the soft clicking of my guideline reel. Suddenly a low rumble reverberated throughout the water. It wasn't the familiar hum of cargo ships. This sound was organic, primordial. Before I could process what was happening, an immense force slammed into me. Pain seared through my body as something punctured my skin. I caught a glimpse of a massive shape, easily ten feet long, its body covered in scales like a snake. Razor-sharp fins sliced through the water as it circled back toward me, blood dripping from its gaping maw lined with dagger-like teeth. Panic overtook me. I frantically swam for the surface, my muscles screaming in protest. The creature pursued, gaining with each powerful undulation. As blackness crept into the edges of my vision, I realized with horror that I had become prey in these dark waters. My last conscious thought was a desperate prayer that someone would find me before this monster finished its meal. Divers venture into unseen worlds, observing serene seascapes and rare wildlife most never witness. They peer through a window into the underwater realms beneath ocean waves, an alluring yet sometimes unsettling experience. Many diver encounters with the unknown leave a lasting impression due to their sheer terror. Here we delve into some diver experiences with enigmatic sea monsters that left them shaken and haunted. One early tale dates back to 1880 in the home of the renowned Loch Ness Monster, Loch Ness, Scotland. Diver Duncan MacDonald was tasked with investigating a shipwreck near the Caledonian Canal entrance at Fort Augustus. Although the dive started under clear conditions, it quickly turned chaotic and mysterious. As noted by author Nicholas Witchell in his book The Loch Ness Story, which I've linked to in the show notes, Soon after descending, MacDonald urgently signaled to be brought back to the surface. Pale and trembling, he remained silent about his observation for days. Once he regained his composure, he recounted encountering an unusual creature resembling a massive frog resting on the rock shelf near the wreck. Despite his silence thereafter, it seemed that MacDonald's encounter marked a boundary between Loch Ness and the canal. In 1933, a report about Loch Ness was featured in the Dundee Courier and Advertiser, shared by a reader recounting an incident involving a man from the village of Methan. The reader mentioned, I discovered that a resident of Methan originally came from Invernessshire. Our discussion led to the topic of the Loch Ness Monster. He recalled how villagers in that area spoke of witnessing a monster near Invermoriston, approximately three miles away at Ruskich. There was a tale of a man sailing his yacht on the loch, being forced towards the shore. As the yacht sank and landed on a rock ledge, the owner sought assistance from a diver named Honeyman from Clancherhary. Despite promising to begin work the next day, Honeyman secretly dove into the water with his crew to inspect the sunken yacht, hoping for personal gain. As the yacht slipped off the ledge and vanished into the depths, the diver was startled by a massive creature around nine feet long with a body as robust as an average man passing in front of him. Terrified, the diver, having had a fright, adamantly refused to dive into the water again. Another underwater observation of the creature known as the Loch Ness Monster occurred when a man named Robert Brock Badger encountered the mysterious being while diving in Urquhart Bay on Sunday, August 8, 1971 to replace mooring. He recounts his experience, saying, After securing the mooring while the others were loading the tools and dinghy into the van, I took a moment to snorkel to ensure the safety of the wetsuit against any potential damage from the equipment. Venturing out from the small floating jetty that existed at the time, I swam into the bay. Approximately a hundred yards from the jetty, the seabed suddenly plunged into deep waters. As I reached a depth of about 10 to 15 feet below the surface, contemplating my return, an object came into view ahead of me. 
The water, resembling thick tea due to the peat content, concealed most of the object with only its top and bottom visible to me. Its structure extended beyond my immediate line of sight in both directions, its surface rough and rounded in shape. Though uncertain of the distance, I estimated being around 15 to 20 feet away from it. The object appeared to be moving from right to left toward the main lock. Although this may seem like a prolonged observation, the encounter lasted only a few seconds. Realizing the nature of the object, I swiftly decided to retreat. With my large, powerful swim flippers propelling me, I surfaced rapidly and hurried back towards the pier. Simon Dinsdale was alerted by my abrupt emergence, noting that I was moving so swiftly that I seemed to be aquaplaning on my chest. As I headed back towards shore, a sense of dread crept over me, fearing pursuit. However, upon spotting Mr. Menzies' nephews enjoying themselves on a boat tethered to the pier and his black Labrador entering the water to greet me, I dared to glance behind me and saw that I was, in fact, alone. Indeed peculiar. Moving on from Loch Ness, a highly unusual account emerges from the Pine Barrens Institute, detailing the reported encounter of an Australian deep-sea diver in the year 1953. The individual, whose identity remains unknown, was reportedly submerged in the depths when they spotted a massive, dark shape looming amidst the murky waters, seemingly suspended in the current. This initial sight was alarming on its own, but what followed would only escalate the sense of dread. As the driver gazed in awe at this colossal, enigmatic entity, a white-tipped shark purportedly swam past it, only to abruptly halt mid-swim and be drawn into the mysterious mass, seemingly engulfed by the creature. Subsequently, the diver came to the realization that the entity was an enormous jellyfish of unprecedented proportions, which had astonishingly consumed a full-grown shark right before their eyes. The Pine Barrens Institute emphasizes the immense size of this jellyfish in their account, alluding to the sheer magnitude of the creature. The lion's mane jellyfish, with its bell diameter reaching over 6 feet 7 inches wide and tentacles growing up to 100 feet long, is the largest known jellyfish in the world. These creatures inhabit cold waters in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific oceans. The largest lion's mane specimen found in Massachusetts Bay in 1870 had a bell diameter of 7 feet and tentacles that stretched 121 feet long. Could a lion's mane jellyfish have been the culprit behind catching and consuming a shark in Australia? Despite its long tentacles, the bell diameter of the lion's mane is not substantial enough to engulf and digest a full-grown white-tipped shark. White-tipped sharks typically measure around 9.8 feet long, with some reaching 13 feet in exceptional cases, outmatching the bell size of the lion's mane by almost 3 feet. For a jellyfish to devour its prey, it must fully enclose the prey in its stomach, known as the cholenterin. If the food exceeds the cholenterin's opening, the jellyfish will release it. This suggests that the jellyfish responsible for consuming the white-tipped shark must have had a bell diameter of at least 12 feet. Consequently, the tentacles of this enigmatic giant jellyfish could have measured over 200 feet or longer. The report also mentions a sighting of a massive jellyfish in 1969 off Bermuda. According to divers Richard Weiner and Pat Boatwright, they spotted a giant, purplish-colored jellyfish with an almost pink outer bell rim pulsating through the water. The diameter of its bell estimated to be nearly a hundred feet across. They quickly left the area. In 1988, professional scuba diver Robert Froster was diving near the Florida coast when he observed a peculiar disturbance in the water from the corner of his eye. Upon turning to investigate, he saw a figure swiftly moving through the murky, foggy water stirred up by sediments. This entity seemed to be undulating towards him, and upon approaching within 20 yards, Froster noticed arm-like appendages with talon-tipped ends reaching out towards him. As it came even closer, Froster described seeing a top half with smooth skin, distinct breasts, and flowing hair, while the bottom half was covered in scales. The being exuded an unfriendly aura, and Froster, alarmed by its gaze, remarked, I've never seen such evil hate in the eyes of any human or animal before. 
he managed to reach the surface and return to his vessel without further incident. From the 1980s comes a chilling tale of an unidentified diver exploring the cave networks of Dublin Lake in Cheshire County, New Hampshire. After surfacing from the depths, the diver was found rambling incoherently about encountering terrifying monsters lurking in the dark waters below. This eerie incident is echoed by another strange event involving a diving bell that became stranded in the same lake due to a severed tether. A scuba diver sent to investigate also vanished, only to be found days later running naked through the nearby woods, recounting a harrowing encounter with mysterious lake monsters. The truth behind what he witnessed remains a mystery. In a separate story from August 1991, a diver near Cape Aya on the Crimean Peninsula, Ukraine, found himself under an unusual encounter while swimming just a hundred meters from shore under a full moon. Sensing a disturbance at his shoulder, he turned to find no one but the sound of splashing water around him. Initially brushing it off as a prank by his companions, he headed towards the shore. However, he was struck forcefully on the shoulder once more. On looking back, he was startled to see the face of a woman in the water, with unnaturally large eyes and a strange bioluminescent glow emanating from her. The fearful observer quickly headed towards the shore with all the strength he could muster, hearing commotion in the water behind him that he resisted the urge to glance back at, fearing what he might behold. As he approached the shore, believing that he had distanced himself from the strange entity, he suddenly felt a sharp poke in his shoulder and once more encountered the enigmatic woman swimming with piercing black eyes exuding what he could only describe as disappointment. Frantically, the swimmer dashed onto the shore in a panic, glimpsing a shining figure splashing in the water before vanishing into the dark depths below. Even after the harrowing ordeal had passed, he couldn't shake off his fixation on the encounter. Seeing the mysterious woman haunting his dreams and feeling compelled to revisit the same location multiple times, yet never laying eyes on her again. Equally chilling is an account from Reddit user Farad8219, who describes an eerie encounter akin to a nightmarish vision. Here's their story. A few years back, a friend of mine decided to surprise me for my birthday by renting a boat for us to head out onto the sea. Everything seemed to be going smoothly. The boat was in great condition, perfect for fishing, and had a spacious deck. Knowing we were going out on the water, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to try using a new mono fin for scuba diving. Since I'd never used one before, I'd been practicing with it and felt confident taking it out into the sea. We set off from the coast near the Cape, with the water a bit chilly but bearable, around 22 miles out while still within sight of land. My friend had brought along fishing gear for later use, and I was all set to jump into the water with my wetsuit, mono fin, and tank in hand. However, after a few minutes, a strange feeling of superstition crept over me. It wasn't paranoia, but more of a gut feeling that something wasn't right. Shrugging it off, I geared up and prepared to dive into the water. As I prepared to dive, that eerie feeling returned, this time escalating to full-blown paranoia when I noticed a pair of gleaming eyes in the ocean. Initially mistaking them for a shark due to my experience with them and other deep-sea creatures over the years, I braced myself. But as the figure drew closer, I realized it was not a shark. It was enormous, with teeth protruding from its jaw and razor-sharp fins covered in scales like that of a snake, blood dripping from its mouth that appeared hungry and formidable. Panic set in as I tried to move quickly, but shock held me back. It wasn't until the creature began to accelerate towards me that I snapped out of it, pushing myself to swim faster with my monofin, though it could only propel me so much in the water. Meanwhile, my friend, growing suspicious of my prolonged absence beneath the surface, peered over the boat's edge and caught sight of me frantically swimming towards safety as the ominous shadow loomed closer. Exhausted and breathless, I made it back to the boat and urgently instructed my friend to get us out of there. We abandoned our plans for the day and headed back home, leaving behind the unsettling encounter with that unknown creature. Even to this day, the mystery remains unresolved, and despite my years of experience, I have no desire to uncover the truth. Also quite alarming is a report from Lake Superior in the United States, 
where diver Todd Ellie was exploring at the entrance of the Duluth Ship Canal on August 22, 2005. This was already quite risky since the area is notorious for its strong currents that have the potential to sweep a diver away. To mitigate this danger, they had driven a four-foot rebar spike into the sand and secured the ends of their guideline spools to it to prevent being pulled away or losing them. The witness recounts what happened next. Swimming outside the canal's imposing wall, we navigated through the crystal clear water 40 feet deep with sunlight creating delicate patterns on our bodies. As we approached the mouth of the canal, a murky brown wall of silt extended for miles into the open water, resembling an underwater river within the lake. Whirlpools and eddies dotted its length, disappearing into the distance. Crossing it meant entering a zone of complete darkness, like night underwater. Stealing our nerves, we plunged into the obscurity. Amidst the clicking of our guideline reels, a low, rumbling sound reached my ears, reminiscent of an outboard motor struggling to start. We had carefully timed our swim to avoid any passing cargo ships. This unfamiliar sound felt more organic, evoking a sense of impending danger. Suddenly, a powerful force struck me, initially mistaken for a drifting tree swept by the current. To my horror, it seized my companion and swiftly pulled him away. The reel of his guideline whirred rapidly before falling silent. Our marker was uprooted from the lake bed as if snatched away by an unseen force. I felt a sharp searing pain as my skin was punctured by an unknown assailant. We had unwittingly become prey in the water's flow. Amidst the chaos, a sense of loss and anguish swept over me. To add to the mystery, the witness later succumbed to a combination of erythema, hypertension, and tachycardia, experiencing symptoms like swelling and vomiting caused by an unidentified nerve toxin. The situation becomes even more perplexing when the creature responsible remains elusive, heightening the bizarre and frightening nature of the encounter. One account shared by Reddit user AAA Work Account illustrates this, saying, In the Atlantic Ocean, the water is around 30 to 50 feet deep, with numerous pocket reefs scattered about. I decided to venture away from a reef to explore a new direction. The visibility is a clear 40 feet as I move forward. Suddenly, just at the edge of visibility near the surface, I spot a massive body before me. The body measures approximately 2 to 3 feet in thickness and spans 6 to 10 feet in length. I can only make out its body, devoid of a head or tail. The creature appears to be a light silver hue with slightly darker golden or brown stripes. It swiftly disappears, perhaps turning in another direction, and leaves me bewildered. Intrigued, I begin swimming towards it. After advancing about 12 feet, a wave of fear washes over me. A primal sense of dread and horror grips my being, urging me to flee from whatever that entity is in the water. Listening to my instincts, I halt my advance and swiftly pivot back towards the boat. I swim on my back, keeping an eye on the spot where I saw the mysterious creature. Although I cannot identify it, the immense size of the being instills a deep sense of danger within me. My primal instincts recognize the threat this unknown creature poses to me prompting me to retreat swiftly. Another report from a diver One way to track a diver is by observing their bubble stream. When a diver inhales, the demand regulator in their helmet provides air from their umbilical, and when they exhale, the air is released into the water and rises to the surface as bubbles. By watching the bubbles from the surface, you can generally track the diver's location. On this particular occasion, we were miles away from land with two divers underwater. After about an hour, we noticed something peculiar. Instead of two bubble streams, there were three coming from where the divers were working. Initially, we attributed this to a current affecting them, until we spotted a fourth set of bubbles originating from a distance and stopping close to the other bubbles. The divers couldn't see anything unusual when asked. Suddenly, we heard a chilling scream from below the water's surface, followed by an eerie silence. While the divers remained unperturbed, we were accustomed to strange sounds underwater that could carry over long distances. However, the water ahead appeared to be teeming with new bubble streams, advancing towards the divers. The supervisor promptly ordered the divers onto the dive stage for retrieval. 
as the bubbles drew closer, the divers reported seeing shadowy figures in the vicinity. Despite their indistinct nature, we decided to extract the divers immediately without completing their decompression stops and place them in the hyperbaric chamber. The events that transpired out there are quite mysterious, particularly concerning a witness named Peter Wesker, a self-professed marine biologist and diver. He encountered a strange occurrence whilst exploring the frigid dark depths near Singapore. At the time, he was employed on a drilling rig that operated at a depth of 400 feet and could bore down as far as 30,000 feet. Peter routinely worked in the pitch-black environment, with only the dim illumination of his diving lights offering some semblance of visibility. However, on one particular expedition, things took a very peculiar turn, and he recalls the incident as follows. We found ourselves submerged to an incredibly deep extent. For context, consider that the peak of Everest stands at 29,035 feet. The dive, just below the water's surface, extended another 30,000 feet beyond the 400 feet distance from the sand to the water's top layer. We were situated right at the ocean bed. The surreal feeling of being at such unfathomable depths never truly fades, engulfed by a boundless void of darkness, aware that ascending to the surface means risking one's life. There's a profound sense of dependence on the surface team to extract you from that environment, which can leave you feeling somewhat powerless. The clamor only added to the tension. Exploring the metallic supports of the oil rig's framework, essentially four immense pillars anchored in the seabed to support the surface platform, proved to be a daunting sight underwater. Covered in rust and overgrown with more algae than I could have imagined, the structure appeared immense and ominous. A few small schools of fish encircled us as we meticulously surveyed the area from top to bottom. The noise started quietly at first, a mix of sounds resembling a roller door and a sliding mesh door opening and closing somewhere in the distance. Despite being faint, it persisted. T-32, Mike, do you hear that? I asked my diving partner, Mike Davis. With poor visibility limiting my sight to just 50 feet, I used my flashlight to scan the sandy seabed for any clues. The sound seemed to originate far below the surface, growing slowly louder. I notified our surface team of the unconfirmed noise emanating from beneath us. After their approval, we reluctantly continued our search. However, the noise intensified, gradually merging into a single, piercing sound akin to an air raid siren echoing from the ocean depths. The ground beneath us trembled as the noise drew nearer. I swore and quickly called for the decompression chamber to be prepared. We were leaving immediately, regardless of whether they agreed. The noise grew louder, and the sand shifted with its vibrations. Initially, I thought the underground drill had malfunctioned and was heading towards us, but I dismissed that idea as absurd. I considered every option as we swam upwards, pausing at a safe distance while awaiting the diving bell's delay. The noise approached relentlessly, and I was certain it would soon break through the sand. This is our stopping point. We can't go any higher. I signaled to my two fellow divers, aware of the risk of hypoxia beyond this altitude. Though it was instinctual, I confirmed our depth on the meter. The eerie sound lingered just beneath the surface, its chilling screeches sending shivers down my spine. I attempted to contact the team through the radio, but all I heard was static. They should have deployed the bell by now. Our internal communication system was still functioning, but the noise was so overpowering that it drowned out all other sounds. It felt as if I could almost touch the source of the sound, its vibrations resonating through the water in every direction. I observed the shadowy outline of a diver as he continued his ascent, before I closed my eyes due to the pounding in my head. It was then that I realized I could no longer hear Davis speaking. At some point, I must have lost consciousness. Upon regaining awareness, I found myself on the surface, being evaluated by the backup diver following decompression. In my foggy state, I never learned whether Keller or Davis had survived. Following that, Nothing eventful occurred apart from a stern reprimand from our dive leader. I was strictly instructed to never discuss the incident with anyone under threat of severe consequences. And that was it. That marked the underwhelming conclusion of my experience. Whatever transpired while we were unconscious, whatever they discovered down there, 
must be detailed in the remainder of the report. Regardless of the risks involved, I am determined to uncover the truth. Could this have been a seismic event? A mysterious sea creature? Or even Cthulhu? It remains a mystery. Here we've delved into a collection of accounts that venture into the realm of the extraordinary. What did these individuals encounter in the depths of our planet's oceans and lakes? How do we make sense of such encounters with the unusual? Ultimately, it suggests that there might be many more discoveries waiting beneath the waves, perhaps some that are best left undiscovered. <laughs>